if you've seen our first video on this channel, then you know how much I love The Last of Us Part 1. So when I got my hands on Part 2, of course I was exactly like... At last! My arm is complete again. Not knowing what to expect from this game, the least of all of my theories was that Part 2 would be a story about... Causality. Action. Reaction. Dad! Dad! Cause. No! An effect. And about the fact that every story, no matter how you feel about the protagonist, is but a mere one-sided version you see until the complete picture is revealed to you and you feel nothing short of bewilderment in the aftermath. Now, I expected the story to be deep like in the first part, but nothing prepared me for the emotional roller coaster I felt during my playthrough of The Last of Us Part 2. You don't get to rush this. Right before I even started to play, I saw the start menu's bold graphics and I was just... Are you kidding? But little did I know that the game had a character model screen that had Ellie in it, and when I saw her graphics, that just ended me right then and there. I was texting all my friends saying, look at the shoes, man, who makes graphics that advanced for shoes? I'm telling you, I was literally afraid to press the play button because my brain couldn't handle the graphics. And I'm sorry, but I gotta go on rambling about the graphics first, cause oh my fucking god are they gorgeous. Just look at this bar, I mean Jesus Christ, everything looks so damn good. Even the snow that glistens, yes I use the word glistens, because the serenity of seeing that snow made me wish it was Christmas all over again. And that's just in the first couple of minutes, because we have nature, a decrepit Seattle, the film theater, and of course... Motherfucking dinosaur! Also the dinosaur museum, the spaceship module, whales, a seal, a burning village, this, yeah. that, oh, this too, that too. <laughs> Honestly, I think almost every scene framed properly is a work of art. You know, it's like in life, if you gotta have a little sadness once in a while so you, you know when the good times come. I'm waiting on the good times now. I was also faced by the seamless transitions between the cinematics and gameplay. I mean, I saw some great transitions in my life, but this was something else. One other feature that I bet a lot of players hate is the film grain. In cinematography, film grain is a texture that looks like tiny particles or really, really small and transparent rice grains that move randomly across the screen. But I'll let someone who actually knows what he's talking about to speak on my behalf. The grain is always moving, it's swimming, which means that even in a still life of, let's say, a flower on a table, that flower is alive even though it's not moving. And that's the difference. Now, film grain here acts like a filter or like an all-encompassing blanket that wraps around the entire image and gives it a certain aesthetic. Another thing I noticed was the scaling of the world in contrast to your character. This is another great thing about the aesthetics because the world itself is like a presence constantly hovering all around you and to me everything was more impactful just because of this reason alone. And like in the new God of War, your character is more zoomed in to make everything feel more personal and real. And to me no other level proved this more than the one inside the skyscraper where everything looks so apocalyptically amazing. I mean, the level design alone was brilliant from my limited point of view, but the visual appeal of it all blew me away. If I could do it, I would honestly show the entire level in this video. But sticking to our neck of the woods, the lens through which you see The Last of Us Part 2 has been modified in such a way that it adds to the atmosphere and ultimately to your immersion. The game refined something that I started to see in older Naughty Dog games like Uncharted 2 when you got your pants wet for example, or when Drake almost bumped into a wall and put his hands in front of him, not just running into it like a complete moron. They just couldn't believe that somebody would do all that running for no particular reason. I just felt like running! These were all great for their time, but in The Last of Us Part 2, the authenticity of how the characters interact with the environment is something off the charts. 
At least for me in any case, because maybe I'm just more easily impressionable or something. While I was drooling at the gorgeous graphics, basking in the eye candy of the sunlight, I kinda squinted my eyes for a bit because of the brightness, but when I saw Joel put his hand up because the sun was getting into his eyes, that was it for me, because my reaction was... Oh, this is beautiful! I can't believe... Thank you! I don't know what to do! It's and that's just one small thing that caught my eye. Cause if you played it, you also know the amazing level of detail in this game right from the beginning. Like Neil Druckmann's Maker's Mark with the PS3 console in Ellie's room, Sam's robot toy from the first game, and Norman Reedus. It kinda makes a parallel with Drake's attic from Uncharted 4, doesn't it? Bullseye. More like in the town where you see every resident as a piece of a larger puzzle that makes up the way of living there. People have trades in this western looking decor, albeit basic ones that explain to the viewer how they manage to survive. Another example of art imitating real life is the fact that the HUD is basically non-existent when you wander about, solidifying your immersion into the story. And while I'm at it, I'd also like to point that this impressed me a lot. I mean, you'd think every developer would do this in every game out there, but uh-uh. Here they took a simple physics simulation with a cable or a rope or whatever and made it so that when you interact with it, it's organic, not forced. And yes, of course the side stories that flesh out the world from the first game are present in part 2 as well, and I love the fact that they even made small side quests involving them. Barcos. Hey, isn't that the key you found? So the game can pull you in even further. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. In The Last of Us Part 2, there are certain moments I wittingly call quiet moments. For example, I saw this window and decided I should go in. Didn't know what to expect, of course, so I ended up in this music shop. Ellie started playing the guitar and I was as enraptured by the scene as much as Dina was. Because they pause all the drama and for a brief moment, you forget all the nasty shit that's going on and you're just being. As always, these are all fantastic little things with which Naughty Dog always treated us in regards to immersion, and I love to see that with every iteration of their franchises, there is a clear and present evolution of them all. You gotta get the full effect. Now, because I'm a child of the 90s, God bless them, I used to love 80s action movies. I love them so much because it made me feel a rush of awesomeness or this sense of amazement. For example, let's party. Nowadays, I don't have that rush at all because movies don't make me scream with joy anymore. They're lamer or something, I don't know. Jacob is Dom's brother. No, no, that's, that's not impressive. But here, when I was being chased as Abby by the infected, I felt the exact same rush I used to feel when I was a kid and I was actually yelling at a monitor with excitement because of what I was seeing. This action sequence and the ones that follow are so ingeniously woven that I couldn't help myself but be in a blissful state of moronicness, if that's even a word. And hallelujah, praise Jesus, that these set pieces continue throughout the game, like for example in this scene that borrowed a bit from Uncharted 4, but hey, who cares, the games are made by the same guy. The list goes on and on, and if I were to talk about them, it'll just ruin everything. So I made this little montage to celebrate them. Savage Starlight comic book that you're into. They're in the walls.
like in the first game you have two enemy factions that are at odds with one another and of course you get stuck in the middle of it all. The most interesting one from my point of view are the Scars. Seraphites. Oh, uh, the Seraphites to be politically correct. We wouldn't want to offend those poor sadistic fucks now, would we? Now he is free. Besides the hanging and the gutting that we all saw in the trailers, what made me shiver with disgust was that fucking whistle. <laughs> Because they don't yell or shout out words, they make this primitive sound that stands for only one thing. And in my head, I got this image of primitive people hunting two million years ago when speech was nothing more than groans. Not unlike the new age mumble crap going on these days. <laughs> and to hear such a primitive sound that is conceived for one purpose and one purpose only, how can you not be anxious when hearing it? I don't know if this was their intention from the get-go, but in my opinion, it's really well implemented. During your exploration, you come across religious shrines or pictures of the one they call the Prophet. You see small hints about her, and as time goes on, they become more fleshed out and more impactful. Honestly, I thought all of them were going to lead up to a confrontation with her, but that's maybe left for a future DLC or something. I'm thinking it would be awesome to play as her during the outbreak to see how she became the leader of the Scars. That would be cool. <laughs> I also like how Lev calls the infected demons. demons. If you think about it, they're a cult, right? So you know exactly how much actual science and facts go into their daily school of teachings. None. So the young ones don't know how it all came to be because of the brainwashing and they make sense of everything by creating this mythological aura around the infected. Hence the word demon. demon. Which is kind of cool when you think about it because it made me wonder what humans actually think they saw back when the word demon was invented to make sense of something they didn't understand scientifically. So I really appreciated this little detail that contains so much essence behind it. Anyway, that's why I was impressed by how the scars were portrayed in this game. The structure of The Last of Us Part 2 is quite simple but extremely effective. Because it's not a standalone pillar within itself, it's vitally connected to the storyline and vice versa. You have the introduction that produces the intrigue, then the story actually starts when we play as Ellie in Seattle and we set off a chain of events, all the while the timeline juggles back and forth between the past and present. Mirroring that, we play as Abby, where we get to see the results of Ellie's actions through a lens of consequences. All the while, Abby gets the same flashbacks treatment as Ellie. If it was me, I'd want you to do the surgery. Then it all comes full circle when the conclusion of all the events is unfolded and the end credits start rolling on the screen. This is just the structure which I think is amazing, but at the same time, it's also just the outline. Now the meat on the bones lies within the story. But before we get there, I want to talk about the flashbacks first. Starting with Ellie, I truly love the back and forth between the past and the present. The purpose behind the switch is obviously to see more of Joel, otherwise you would have been left with a bad taste in your mouth. This way. The worst! Another purpose behind the contrasting timelines is, let's call it a mood palette cleanser. Because in the present, everything is gray, the air feels oppressive, it's all bleak, kill or get killed, whereas in the past, the colors are warm and fuzzy, the sunlight is so pretty, oh my god, it's like Rapture has cometh and thou shall be bathed in the holiest of the game's graphics. A great example during the blast from the past was the scene from three years prior when Joel surprised Ellie with the trip to the museum. That entire moment, but especially the one in the space module when she was listening to the launch tape and the light was acting like a see-through veil between us and her imagination, was one of the greatest moments I have ever seen in any entertainment format. The same structure is applied to Abby's storyline as well, and that symmetry appears throughout the entire game. The mechanism behind it is meant to take you through these two states, so a balance is achieved and thus you'll never get tired of playing the game. 
The third and more important reason is to slowly unravel what happened between Joel and Ellie and to see how their relationship turned out so badly. A series of events that culminates right at the end when the reason of why Ellie was so hell-bent on getting her revenge is revealed. I love that it's not being thrown in your face, but it's subtle and in line with the rest of the masterful nuances painted in the story. The deeper reason behind her obsession relies within these two scenes. I was supposed to die in that hospital. My life would have fucking mattered. But you took that from me. And the second one. I don't think I can ever forgive you for that. But I would like to try. Now try to think about it this way. If she was so pissed at Joel because he robbed her of her choice, what do you think she would do to someone who would rob her of her chance of patching things up with Joel? The exact same goddamn thing the writers made her do with such relentlessness. It's a complete narrative circle that excuses and explains everything, and to my concern, it's just formidable writing. Now that's one parallel of the narrative, but another is the mirroring between Ellie and Abby. Not only in the present timeline, which we will go into later, but more to our point, during the past. Their stories are so closely linked that basically on the spectrum of the storyline, they're actually one and the same. Even the father-daughter motif is invoked to point that out as clear as daylight. Or the moment at the aquarium when Abby is younger, which is meant to replicate the emotions felt during Ellie's flashback with Joel at the museum. Apparently, the writers really wanted us to identify Abby with Ellie in almost every aspect. But why? During Abby's flashbacks, she appears to be hell-bent on the only thing in her adult life that she ever sought, revenge on Joel. Owen creates this wonderful, magical moment between the two of them, and when the scene reaches its apex, she backs down, bringing up Joel. What I'm trying to say is that she became so lost in her revenge story that she was blinded to everything else in her life. She can't even have one moment of peace or relaxation from her sole purpose. Much like Ellie with Dina towards the end of the story. No. <sighs> to me, the purpose behind it all is that by the end we wouldn't see Abby as a monster, but a victim of circumstance and also to not want her to die at Ellie's hand. Something I felt wholeheartedly. Now this kind of back and forth piece by piece storytelling is just sublime because the experience of being witness to his grandeur is humbling to me as a storyteller wannabe because I see how much narrative ingenuity was infused in the writing of this game so I'm just struck with awe and left there with a state of acute melancholy just wishing that damn, one day I hope I can write like that. If I ever were to lose you, I'd surely lose myself. Everything I have found here, I'm not found by myself. Try and sometimes you'll succeed to make this pain of me. All my stolen missing parts, I've no need for anymore. Cause I believe. I believe, cause I can see our future days, days of you and me. As far as the story goes, I truly love how everything was woven together. For example, how the game starts exactly where it left off in the first part. I feel that this brings a seamless continuity to the experience, even though the two games are seven years apart. 
Now, at the time before I knew he was going to die, I wasn't enamored with the fact that Joel took a back seat in this game. I mean, after I fell in love with the character in the first part, in this one I should have considered myself lucky if I would get glimpses of him as a side character? Uh-uh, I wasn't okay with that at all. But alas, complained as I'd may, who would have cared, cause you know, he was fucking killed. And man, when I saw that scene, I literally gasped and was left breathless because my chest just took a massive blow. I was kinda expecting things to turn out this way because they advertised the game as being a revenge story, so what else could have happened? I'm gonna find... and I'm gonna kill... every last one of them. Next time, maybe try to put a lid on it, okay Naughty Dog? Anyway, at the time, I was dismayed to see Joel getting his knee blown off and that fucking bitch wailing on his head like he was a piece of meat. I mean, man, he got Ned Stark heavily and I felt the exact same thing here that I felt when Ned got his head chopped off. So, of course, after the scene, I was like, Would somebody please explain this to me? Because with all the nasty shit going on in my life right now, I didn't need to see Joel getting viciously murdered like that. <sighs> what can you do, huh? It's how the story was written, and the fact that the writers actually took this risk and turned it into such a wow factor, I have to applaud the boldness of it all, and the fact remains that the writers at Naughty Dog are masters of their craft when it comes to playing the strings of her emotions like a goddamn harp. That's so. <laughs> That's a lot. The only catch here is that he's only the beginning. They Game of Thrones almost everyone. I was starting to really like the new characters like Owen or Manny, then it was like the Red Wedding all over again but with better graphics. The short version here is that violence begets violence and the road to revenge is a treacherous one. Because much like what Ellie was going through after every major assassination, the difference between the thought of revenge and what its manifestation actually implies to achieve that goal takes a severe toll on your soul and you don't come out the same person at the other end. And we'll get into that later on. Now as a side note, I want to say this. As I started playing the game way before I finished it, I thought I had a better idea for the story. Just listen. Let's say that we needed a drama to trigger the events of the second game. Instead of killing Joel, we kill off Tommy, Maria, Dina, Jesse and half of the population of Jackson while we're at it. Let's say the Scars raided them. Then we have Joel and Ellie teaming up for revenge like never before, an awesome ruthless dynamic duo that will stop at nothing to avenge Tommy and so on. Then we could have them meet Abby having a different or no dad somewhere down the line and team up against the Scars. Heck, maybe even see Abby fall in love with Ellie and live happily ever after. Maybe it's stupid, I don't know, you tell me. But at the point of writing my very short version, I would have rather have Joel live and see him wreak havoc on those godless sum of bitches. So bam, there you have it, The Last of Us Part 2 rewritten by Late to the Party. Ink. But then I finished the game and my point of view of the narrative chosen did a 180. Because all in all, I think it took a huge dose of balls to make me experience the abhorrent death of my favorite character and then to make me play as the person that killed him and as I would go on to make my view on that character change so much as to really like and respect her in the end. I mean, Jesus Christ, what a roller coaster of emotions. So, The Last of Us has a knack of switching up characters when at least expected, but when the camera settled from this cinematic onto Tom Hardy's twin sister's shoulders, I was... What the hell just happened? At first, I fucking despised her to hell. Fucking goddamn fucking bitch! But at the same time, I thought, hey, that's what the creators want me to feel. Well... Mission accomplished because it's totally working. But as the story moves forward, we see bit by bit that Abby had good motives for ruthlessly killing Joel. And honestly, I would have done the same thing if I was her. 
So, after the game makes us walk in her shoes and we see how humane she is that she's really not evil, we start liking her. Or at least I did. Hey, sir. Ah, Abby. How are you feeling? Fantastic. That's what great stories do. They start off with a great impact, it shocks and hooks you, then it slowly unfolds everything and carries you along till the end. So I've said that The Last of Us Part 2 is a story about causality and aftermath. That's what I loved most about her story and why at the end everything she did was excused. Also, why I didn't want Ellie to kill her. I mean, the fact that they were both alive by the end and each was set on a new path finally put my soul at ease because I was sick and tired of all the death and misery the story was overflowing with. Ellie's story in The Last of Us Part 2 is one of choice between letting go or damnation. I'm not gonna do this again. That's up to you. And by this point, we know that Joel was a hunter and he did some nasty stuff back in the day. But he wasn't evil, he did what he had to do and lived with it because it was part of the way of life after the outbreak. Now in parallel, Ellie is dead set on the path of revenge, and as we can see, little by little, she's more or less like Joel was back then, and it is clear that treading on this path comes at a great cost. We see Ellie's inner struggle being symbolized by a moth. Her tattoo is of a moth, they're even present in a loading screen, and most importantly, it's on the guitar. What that symbolizes, of course, is a forewarning of what will be if she continues to head towards the fire like a moth to a flame. For example, like in the scene where she was fighting Abby at the end, and I couldn't help but feel sorry for what Ellie has become. Going at her throat so viciously, even though Abby clearly said, That meant only that Ellie was too blinded by revenge. In the end, she did pay a pound of flesh, because losing her fingers symbolizes how her relentless quest got a part of her that she will never recover, much like what happened to Tommy. Consider it like a poetic physical manifestation of the malformation of the soul. In hindsight, the warning behind this motif was also present at the start of the game when Joel sang to her. A song that Ellie herself tried to play at the end, but couldn't anymore. Okay. On top of losing Dina and JJ, she also lost the ability to play the guitar. And that last one stands for the fact that she forever lost part of Joel. Because he taught her how to play and for her not being able to do so anymore, the meaning behind those moments between the two of them faded away forever. She's yours. No. Oh. No, 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 I don't know the first thing I about this. I promise that I teach you how to play. You did. So earlier I mentioned about my version of The Last of Us Part 2 with Joel being alive and all of them living happily ever after. Well, maybe that's the problem with my version, it's just too light. When you think about it, perhaps their version of the story is more lifelike than we want it to be. Real life doesn't care about what you think, want or need and the story from Part 2 is no exception from proving that rule. Maybe that's why I came up with my version of the story, because I'm tired of life being so indifferent in general that I didn't want my favorite game in the world to be part of that through the death of Joel. But all in all, The Last of Us Part 2 took me on a journey as wonderful as it was filled with grief and sorrow, and I'm just thankful I got to experience such a cathartic story, the very best I have ever played in my entire life.
which I go I'm going there to see my father I'm going there no more to run I'm just a Oh, oh.